I was thinking this morning through this series in that we must reject the thinking that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bring those thoughts in obedience to Christ. But we must not only reject the thinking that is unbiblical, we must replace that once we have rejected it. Or we will be empty and it would be sort of a picture of Matthew 7 on self-reformation. And we just can't do it on our own. We need the Lord Jesus. So Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 and 9, would you stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word? And we're so thrilled that you're here today. The Bible says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do and the God of peace will be with you. What a marvelous promise. The God of peace. Anybody lack peace here this morning and really desire for the God of peace to come and to rule in your heart? Heavenly Father, speak into our hearts for Christ's sake. Amen. You may be seated. In this passage, the apostle Paul's spirit-directed arrow strikes at the bullseye of much of the low living in Christendom. Uh, what a reminder that attention must be given to consecrated thoughts, that is, holy thoughts. Impure thinking produces inconsistent living. Whoever lacks virtue in their thinking cannot help but to act indecently. So holy living follows sanctified thinking. The Bible teaches in Proverbs 4.23, keep your hearts, or it could be translated, keep your minds with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life. So God's people must not only act as Christians, but even more, they must think as Christians. The Bible teaches in Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. So only Christ can give such victory to a believer. Therefore, here's two great passages from the Psalms we should pray. Psalms 19 verse 14. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Psalms 139 in verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. In other words, the word that's used there, God show me what it is that divines my allegiance to a holy God. And see if there is any wicked way in me and then lead me in the way everlasting. Well, we've been talking about the construction of a biblical mind. We preached the first week in this particular series from verses 8 and 9 that you build a biblical mind based on truth and then you build it based on honor and then you build it based on divine standard which means building on what is right what is just and you build it on purity and so we have to be pure in our hearts and in our motives but then also I pick up today in that we need to build it on that which is pleasing to God. When the Bible says that we're to think lovely thoughts, it means I'm thinking thoughts that are pleasing to God. Did the way I respond, the thoughts I have, were they pleasing to God? The truth is, oftentimes not. But remember, as Adrian Rogers said, the devil had rather get you to think wrong than to do wrong. If you do wrong, but you're thinking right, you'll get right. But if you are thinking wrong, and then you do wrong, you'll find yourself compromising and trying to justify the deed. And so when you're trying to walk with God and be sensitive to the Spirit of God in devotion and prayer, God will show you the things you say, the actions that you portray and express that are not 
pleasing to God. Now, it's interesting, the word lovely, this is the only place in the entire Bible that it is used. It translates sweet, gracious, generous, or patient. But wouldn't that be a good way to always respond, to be sweet, to be gracious, to be generous, or patient? It was a word that was used to describe the fine arts or to describe music, which spoke of being orderly. It means beautiful and attractive. It speaks of that which calls for love. It's a quality that it causes love to respond to it. So we're to think about the things that reach down within our hearts and cause us to respond in love. And the only way that can happen is for us to be thinking properly. It's a word that can be translated winsome. See, love should always be the undergirding force of all our relationships in Christ. A Christian without love is like a ship without a rudder. So when lovely becomes described as the way we think, God will let us build bridges and not barriers. Uh, we will throw bouquets and not bombs. Uh, we will love and not cause discord. Uh, we'll be selfless and not be self-centered. We will promote harmony, unity, and not cause strife. So what we think about makes all the difference in how we respond. Uh, do you know any lovely people? Do you know people that respond properly? And, and we may say, well, all the time. I'm uh, called, honestly, I had one of these calls from uh, Las Vegas yesterday. And they were calling to ask me about a preacher. And he's a wonderful young preacher. And I begin to give words of commendation. And then they said, we have 15 questions for you. And I can always know what one of the questions is always they always say what would you say are some of his strengths as I can say well man I heard him preach he's a dynamic preacher he's really devoted to his family and his children and then they'll ask this question name his weaknesses to which I have a it's almost a standard response check with his wife really when you want to now unless you're around someone a lot uh, you may not know what their weaknesses are. You, you may just say they're just lovely all the time. But those that know us better and are around us a lot, oh, I just have to say, got to be honest here, I would like to hit more on that than not, but there are times that we're not. I, I just wrote it down. It's in the notes if you follow me. Edna Whitmire went to be with the Lord at 93. She was on the pulpit committee when I became pastor here. Uh, she was a big influence in my life loved me like a mother she was a lovely person some of you remember a lady by the name of Abby Brown Abby Brown was a lady that just uh, exuded the love of Jesus she was so positive so encouraging uh, when she showed up the party began and then even in our own church and I just want to lay a bouquet this morning I could say it about so many different people but honestly Neil Hughes is just that type person he just uh, exudes the love of Jesus in such a lovely godly man well the Bible also talks about not just building on things that are pleasing to God but building on things that add edify so when the Bible says think on things of good report it means that you're thinking on things that build us up uh, someone says to me, uh, I, I don't really go to church. I don't think you have to go to church to be a Christian. And that is a true statement. However, I believe if you want to be an obedient Christian, you find a local body of believers and you join them based on what the Bible teaches in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, and a whole lot of other things. It only stands to reason that you would love what Jesus Christ died for. I've often said that it's just impossible to love the, the Father the, and not love his brother. And the church is the bride of Christ. But it builds up. Did you know that the Bible teaches that one of the reasons we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together is we're to come together and listen to this, excite one another to love. Did you know that God wants to use me to build you up? Did you know that God wants to use you to build me up? I could hardly leave my Sunday school class this morning because the, the teaching was so wonderful and the engagement of all of the young men and young women in that class was so encouraging. It edified me. It built up in my own life. 
And so John Phillips put it this way. Because of the fall in the Garden of Eden, we have a bias toward the degenerate. The secret of a guided thought life is an active assertion of the will in cooperation with the Holy Spirit to think on these things. Now, the word there, good report, is one of those words that I would say is pregnant with meaning. It signifies the delicacy with which uh, we guard our lips, that nothing may be expressed in public worship that could disturb devotion or give rise to a scandal. So it refers to that which does not offend. So instead of offending, we're building up. It speaks of the capacity to look for something helpful to say, even if you can't agree with everything that's being done. Uh, if you have to disagree, do it in such a way that even your disagreement has helpful suggestions incorporated. In other words, a Christian has no luxury ever to be unkind. So when I'm unkind, I'm choosing to not edify to not be lovely. So good report speaks of all that rings true to the highest standard. It refers to anything that is good to speak about. Uh, this word, before it made its way in to the Koine Greek of the New Testament, uh, we could study this word in what we call classical Greek. And the word seems to go back to a pagan practice. Now follow this. This is a really great truth about speaking what edifies and what is of a good report. At the altar of a pagan god, at the point when the sacrifice was being offered, uh, there was always in the Greek world a time of silence. It was as though the only thing to be heard was that which was worthy of the gods which were being appeased by their sacrifice. So the word found its way into the Christian church and now translates in the context of think on those things that are fit for God to hear. I'll be honest with you. There's some things that I've said before that I just wouldn't want to say directly to God, but I said them in his hearing. And just not aware of it. And then later uh, is only God can do when you're studying and praying and having a quiet time with the Lord. God brings that up. And I don't know about you, but I'm still grateful that 1 John 1, 9 is in my Bible. That if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what if only the words spoken were words fit for God to hear? So listening to such words build us up. So the believer's thoughts are elevated by scripture to fix on the lo loftiest theme. So here, what have we been doing for several weeks? The construction of a biblical mind and these are the materials that God uses to build that mind. Now, let me go a step further. Let me talk to you for a few minutes about the commendation of the biblical mind. He goes on to say in verse number eight, if there is any virtue if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Concentrate. Bring it up over and over again. Take it down in your heart. Bring it up and think about it through the day and in your life and in your quiet time and in your daily walk with the Lord. Now, what he says, if there's anything virtuous, it does not suggest doubt, but it has the meaning of since or because. Because there's virtue. Since there is virtue. So since you are a Christian, you should think on these things. And then it tells why. Now listen carefully to this. When we think properly, it serves as a form of motivation in the Christian life. Now, the word virtue means that it motivates us to do better. I need all the motivation I can get to do better, to think on the things that honors God. Again, in classical Greek, the word refers to any kind of excellence. If there be any excellence in thinking like this, any virtue, it, it could be uh, the excellence, listen to this, using it uh, just pragmatically. It could be the excellence of a farmer harvesting his crop. You may think, what, what does that got to do with it? Now follow this reasoning. It could be the excellence of a tool performing its job. The word virtue at its root speaks of accomplishing that for which it was designed or created. God created me for the express purpose to
to glorify God. And he wants me to do that by thinking right because if I think right and believe right, it will affect my behavior. I'll begin to live right by the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And so he says it's, uh, it's motivating. So virtuous things are those that enhance our relationship with God. Uh, that can lift us up. That can improve and mature our fellowship with God. Some of my men met with me this week and I've already been reading and researching and studying in this area and reading some books in this area about those men that have really walked with God. And some of the men are saying, you know, we're at a point we just want to go deeper. They want a, a, a greater life of holiness for their life to count, to, to live a real sanctified life. And they'll never be sanctified living unless there is first sanctified thinking. We've got to think right in order to live right. And so virtuous, enhance our relationship with God. It lifts us up. It improves and matures our fellowship with God. But let me go a step further. Not just its motivation, that's why we commend biblical thinking, but its commendation. He says, if there be anything praiseworthy, what that really means is, if there's anything worth commending to others, See, that's the thing about the Christian life. The Christian life is so precious. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus, is so wonderful that we ought to be commending his life to others. That, that's what it means to witness. That's what it means to share your faith and to talk often of Jesus. In Psalms 119, verse 165, he says, Great peace have those who love your word, love your law, uh, and nothing causes them to stumble. He's commending God's word, which really leads to biblical thinking. You can read it in the notes. I'm not going to take time to go into detail with it, but I read the story of a, a gentleman that was a psychiatrist that ended up in a Nazi camp uh, by the name of uh, Victor Frankl. And Victor lived every day in fear of the fact that he was going to be one of the next in the train that would take them to a camp where they would go into an incinerary. And so it was, it was overwhelming. He, he said some people worried so much they actually worried themselves to death. But he began to say, wait a minute, I've got a choice. And, and I want you to stay with me for a moment. Some of you may say, listen, I've got such a rut in my mind. I've been in this Christian journey so long. And I, I guess I'll just never think that way. I've already maxed out. I don't know that I can go to another level. That's not what the Bible says. You've got a choice to make. He made a choice to say, I'm going to think right. So he said that in the place where they had him, that he would actually look through the slabs, the slats in the wall so he could see a sunrise or a sunset, so he could focus on the fact that God is alive, that he's still causing the sun to rise and causing the sun to set. And he said that he, he just had to come to realize that there was an independence in his own heart that God had given him where he could make a decision to think on the things that are right. Long story short, after three years in that Nazi concentration camp, he was set free. And one of the things that he says that he believes really caused him to make it is that he decided that he would think mentally and spiritually in a way that it would change his mindset. He was mindful of that promise in Isaiah uh, chapter 26 and verse 3 where the Bible says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. And so Paul instructed the Corinthians to keep bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so here we have the construction of a biblical mind. It's a, a, a principle of thinking that is commendable. Uh, you begin to see that you function in a way to which you were made. But let me go a step further. And this is where I'll try to, uh, this, this is sort of where the rubber hits the road. It's one thing to think right. We've seen the benefit of it. It builds others up. We, we say things that are, that we would even be thrilled for God to hear. But then what is the commitment of a biblical mind? Look at verse 9. Let's walk through it in these few short minutes we have left. He said, the things which you learned and received, listen to those verbs, heard and saw. Four of them. I learned it, I received it, I heard it, and I saw it. And then he says, in me. He uses himself as a personal example. These do. Now it's getting very pragmatic. He's calling you to do something. It begins to sound like uh, James, that the theologian of practicality, where he just says, do something with it. And then he gives a promise. He says, and the God of peace will be with you. 
see, not only did the Apostle Paul teach the truth to the Philippians, he epitomized its teachings by his godly example and emulation. He didn't just teach truth for the people to believe, he believed what he taught. Boy, that's a good word for all of us Sunday school teachers, all of us that have a platform to share truth, is to make sure that we really believe the truth that we're presenting. So preaching and teaching is valueless unless supported by an exemplary life. And that's what Paul's saying. So I want to give you three statements. Number one, this passage calls for what I would, would call a careful exhortation. He begins, first of all, by talking about a learning experience. He said, the things which you learned. That's the information that he gave. It's what he declared. It's teaching. It's really where we get our word for disciple. When you, when you think about how do you disciple someone, they get into a learning mode and you are teaching them. You're teaching them what God has said. You are exemplifying for them, modeling for them the type of life that a Christian should live. So here you are at church this morning. I'm trying to give careful exhortation. I'm trying to encourage you with God's word and I'm trying to give the best meaning I can to these words. But here's the personal experience. The Bible says not only things you learned, but received. The word is used for receiving something. Here, look at me for a moment. Everybody look, I want you to hear this. It means that when you go to Sunday school and when you come to church, God help us, God have mercy on your pastor. That there's a takeaway. You, you don't leave here empty. That there's something God speaks. It implies that they responded to the information by taking it to themselves. You, you have a responsibility that you take it to yourself. It comes from the technical term, listen to this, a technical term in the Greek for God's revelation. It means when I'm up speaking this morning, you know, you can go away and say, Pastor Johnny said this, and there's a lot of things I do say like that, but I pray that the majority of what I say is an explanation of God's eternal, everlasting, infallible, inspired word of Almighty God. Here's how Paul said it to the church at Thessalonica. Listen to this, 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard, Heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The, the word of God, the Bible, that we're explaining right now for the express purpose of discipling the body of Christ actually has the power to work effectively in your life. You know what you all are? You mature believers. You know what you are? You are a display of the power of the Word of God. You are actually giving testimony how God's Word affected you for His glory. It means that you take God's Word and appropriate it in order to express it. Now, let me go a step further. There's also a concrete example. He moves now to the words hearing and talk. Now, what do you mean he heard? That means that before people came, uh, they heard his testimony preceding him, his reputation before him met him. In his absence, they heard it. So when he was there with them, but then when he would be gone, they knew there was a consistency in what they had heard. So what they heard, they actually gave testimony to. They heard. But then he said, they saw um, Roy Fish has been a professor of evangelism at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. What a humble, godly man. He has written, he has taught. Almost every student that ever goes to Southwestern, which is not mild, mild mine Southeastern. But most that will go there will make reference somewhere about Roy Fish. Roy Fish, seemingly in my life, captured this phrase. Evangelism is not taught. Evangelism is caught. I'm going to go a step further. That's true of the whole Christian life. Giving is not just taught. You get around somebody that's generous and giving can be caught. Loving others and being selfless and thinking about others is not just taught, but oftentimes when you see it exemplified in someone else's life, it becomes caught. 
So what he's talking about is firsthand experience. Here's what it means. They observed his character. Dwight J. Pentecost put it this way. Maturity in the Christian is not measured by what a man knows, but what a man does. So Paul said, these things that you received, you heard, you saw in me and learned, do. Paul dares to point to his life in Philippi as an illustration of a biblical mind. Uh, the preacher is the interpreter of the spiritual life, but he's also to be an example of it. I'm not just to stand every week and try to teach God's word. I'm also called by God to exemplify this life. I'm to model it. Do you realize the challenge that is? And guess what? It's not just true in my life as a minister. It's true in your life as a Christian. You are to model these prayers. Listen, the only hands Jesus has are your hands. The only mouth he has in the 21st century is yours. The only feet to take the gospel are yours. The only life to live his life through is yours. And I'm telling you, if I choose this week to not think biblically, and some weeks I don't, he's not clearly seen through me. But if I'll surrender to him afresh and anew, this morning when I was journaling, the first words I wrote is today, as I begin my 26th year, I rededicate my life to your call and my commitment to living for you. And so this morning, unashamedly and publicly, I want to say this, I'm rededicating my life to Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but there is something overwhelmingly encouraging about God just giving you a clean slate. And say, so let's just start afresh today. Uh, last night I talked about two things that come to mind, mercy and grace. Mercy, God did not give me what I deserve. Thank God for him. And by the way, not only did he not give me what I deserve when I came to him, his mercies are new every morning. His compassions fail not. If he ever decides one morning, if he ever decides one morning, no more mercy. And in His grace, He gave me what I didn't deserve.